What's up, guys? Eric Helms. Um, 3DMJ folks, um, I feel like I need to make this video because this is um, something I feel partially responsible for. So this video is about science and its application to, um, you know, bodybuilding or not really just bodybuilding, but anything that is something that you can actually practice. So, um, you know, I'm a big proponent and I've been a big part of uh, evidence-based approaches to uh, fitness, bodybuilding, powerlifting, gaining strength, all that stuff. So I kind of feel it's my responsibility uh, to make sure that if I'm encouraging the use of science-based information, that we have an understanding of what science can tell us and what it can't, okay? So when I talk about science, I'm specifically um, referring to uh, using studies to guide practice, okay? Um, so let's get kind of the, the operational terms together. I'm not talking about scientific theory or um, like a biology textbook or things like that. That stuff's great, you know, that's typically something that's more grounded and long-term, you know, knowledge we've had for a while. I'm more talking about someone going uh, to PubMed and, um, and taking a bunch of studies to base their practice on. Um, that can be an, an awesome way to, to guide your practice, but at the same time, you need to know its limitations, okay? So, first off, there are a couple different branches of, of types of research and types of study. Uh, probably the two main ones are what I would call applied research versus mechanistic research, okay? Um, and to get not too specific, applied research is basically very close to what you might see in real life. So like if uh, you do a study where you take 15 guys from the gym <clears throat> and um, you have them train like they normally do and along the way you measure their 100 maxes and, and do some, and let's say you throw them in a DEXA scanner so you can get their body composition um, and you just kind of roughly kind of control their training to make sure it's pretty similar um, and then um, you know, you run a statistical analysis and then you come back and you change either their training or their diet and how you do it exactly the same way again and you see what happens, that would be an applied study. Because um, you're looking at something in an applied nature that's, that's close to practice. However, a mechanistic study would be something like maybe examining a rat model or, you know, you're using animals because you can't do it with people because uh, it's, it's, un it's unethical or, um, or examining cells in a petri dish or looking at a very, very short time window, like a couple of hours in the body's response to something, um, it might tell you about the mechanism of how it works, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do about it. So, there are a couple of ways that science can be misapplied. If you take a mechanistic study and um, use that to inform your practice, you're probably going over a few steps, you're making a lot of assumptions about what, about what might be happening down the line. I would say a great example uh, and one that I'm dealing with all the time in my field as a protein researcher is people looking at uh, a four-hour study on a protein synthesis response to um, only in ingesting uh, protein and looking at tracers in the body versus instead of looking at like a 12-week study uh, and seeing did you gain or lose lean body mass. So basing a meal plan or strategy or or supplementation or something like that based off a four-hour study that was done in a lab and people eating very abnormally and only looking at a four-hour period and not actually getting any true markers for gains in strength or hypertrophy probably shouldn't inform. It's just not a good, not a good practice. You want to be then going, okay, that tells me something. Now I'll try to put it into something more applied and then that can then inform practice. So that's, that's fallacy one. Um, don't typically don't look at a mechanistic study to inform practice, okay? Um, fallacy two, or not even necessarily fallacy, but uh, misapplication two of science, especially in our field for fitness, would be not understanding what a study actually tells you. So every study is run with a, a statistical analysis. And the reason why you have to do a statistical analysis is so that you can actually tell if there was a measurable effect that wasn't random and sometimes you want to tell what the magnitude of the effect was um, and, and a number of other things. So there's, there's a few different ways to run st stats but in all of them you're going to get a sample of a population. 
Uh, the reason why you get the sample is you want it to be representative of the population so that when you finish your study, you can be sure with a reasonable amount of statistical accuracy that what happened in that study is representative to what would happen in the real world. So if a study tells you um, that uh, taking supplement B should improve performance, um, and someone takes it and they say, oh, my performance went down, that doesn't mean they're a liar, okay? Because in that study, if you were to get the actual individual results, you might find that, say, 80% of the people had a small measurable effect, 10% say had none, and then 10% of the people had a negative effect. Like it actually made it worse for some reason. And then what it does is it runs statistics on it and gets the overall effect on that sample. And then we make a statement about the whole population. Um, and what I've seen a lot of people who have very good intentions of trying to use evidence-based uh, you know, practice do is they look at a study and they will tell someone, no, no, this is what should be happening. So, you know, if you, if you say you respond to low volume training, sorry buddy, you're lying or you're stupid or you don't know how to track your progress because this study says that high volume training is better. Or, no, 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 creatine should be doing this and if it doesn't, it means you're lying, you're stupid or you're not taking it right uh, or something like that. Um, or telling someone who has been in the game 15 years and has done through a lot of trial and error, found a certain way of training or, or, or eating and telling them that they're dumb and they need to change the way they're doing it. Um, well, here's the thing, is that a study can't tell you about individual results unless you have the individual results. Because in that example I gave, if the results say, you know, this supplement should improve, or this, this, this supplement improves uh, strength and body composition, and then uh, you went actually back to the participants in the study and you found the person who got a negative response from it, you can't tell them, oh, you lied or you're stupid, because you did the study. You controlled that outcome, you watched what they did, and you saw them get a negative response. Um, outliers are, 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 and stats are what's called people who are on either side of the bell curve, and they get a different response than is expected by most people. But they're real people. You know, that means that if in a study of, of, of 15 people, or let's say 10 people, since they're using 100%, one guy got a negative response and it was the actual response he got, um, that means that you know, 10 out of 100 or 100 out of 1,000 would get this negative response from, from that supplement. And this is a totally arbitrary example, but the point is, is that there are going to be people who do not respond the way a study says because they are on the outside of that bell curve. They are not the typical responder. And if you're a practitioner, like if I'm a coach, uh, the way I, I deal with this is, is I simply, I start with broad strokes. I put people on an evidence-based plan based on what you know, science has told us, and then as I'm tracking their data and I see over time, oh, he does better with lower volume. Oh, he does better with low fat. Oh, wow, he has a really fast meta metabolic rate, higher than I'd be expected. I don't just assume they're lying, because that's probably not very conducive to me being a successful coach. What I do is I adjust, and I go off the data I've collected on them, not the data that some guy in 1985 or, or even last year got with 50 people and found was the average of all of them, okay? So science doesn't tell you about individual responses. It tells you about a sample of a population and what happens in most people in that population, okay? So if you are tracking and doing something and you're consistently finding that you get a response when you have all the other variables controlled in a certain way, then that is real data. And, and if it goes counter to some study you've read, then so what, you know? You're a fool if you are changing something that is working because a study told you it shouldn't be working that well when you are, have the data right in front of you, whether if you're a coach or an athlete running your own stuff, okay? So now that said, that doesn't mean that every person who's been dogmatic and fearful and has not wanted to change uh, something and is just kind of stuck with what works, couldn't be doing it better. It's not to say that the status quo, you know, of the, the old school bodybuilding approaches can't be challenged. Because many times, people will come to me and say, oh, the supplement was great, man. I started training, you know, I started eating, and I took the supplement and I blew up. And it's like, well, was it the supplement or was it the training or the eating? 
So, you know, people don't necessarily know how to isolate variables and track them and be controlled. But if you are doing that, like in my case, when I have people sending me a spreadsheet with like four pages and all kinds of variables and subjective rating sheets and all these things and they talk to me every week and I'm controlling all their macronutrients and all their training, if I see a response and a correlation, it's real, it's there. It's not misreporting, it's not, um, yeah, I guess it could be misreporting, but um, it's not, it's not bullshit. It's, it's an actual thing that you're noticing and you, when you're coaching one person, you go off that one person's response. When you're making statements about a large population, yeah, that's when science is appropriate, okay? So there's a reason why people can publish case studies. There are entire journals dedicated to case studies, and you can publish articles and, and do research on individuals, because individual changes matter, and um, it can be useful to a practitioner if they can find a case study that has simil similar characteristics to the person they're dealing with. Because often what happens as a practitioner is you start with an evidence-based practice and then something is not going the way you would hope it would or it would expect it would from the science. So then you've got to figure out, okay, what's going on with this person? Maybe they have you know, abnormal glucose regulation or maybe they are a non-responder to this supplement or what have you or whatever. And there are many, many, many uh, types of variations we can have in the human body. I mean, we are incredibly varied and there's a a large diversity between one person and the next. And I see it all the time. I've had people on three times the carb intake of someone else um, who is the same age, weight, and gender, you know, and getting a, a, a very similar response in terms of a body composition change. I've had people who can handle three times the volume of someone else. Um, I've seen people who really can't handle high volume. Um, you know, like Jeff Alberts just responds very well to low volume and frequent training and it's just the way he is, you know. Um, I can absolutely hammer my upper body volume and I get a very small growth response compared to almost doing anything with my legs when they grow. Um, I respond to super high refeeds and very low low days when I have to get lean. Um, these are all things that are outside the norm. So what, you know. Um, I would even say that most people have one or two things that are outside the norm, you know, because you're going to be trying to manipulate so many variables like your nutrition, your training, your supplementation, your cardio, uh, losing fat, how you respond when you get below your set point, how quickly can you put on muscle, how quickly can you lose fat, how quickly do you put on body fat, uh, where do you hit your set point, all that stuff. And if any one of them isn't the norm, that means that going by what a scientific study might say, could get you not optimal results. So I think it's great that we're using science. I think this is a fantastic movement and I'm proud to be a part of it and to encourage it. But I also want you guys to know that a huge part of this is just tracking your information consistently, being aware of your variables, changing one thing at a time, and paying attention to your individual response. That is the way a good athlete should operate, that is the way a good coach should operate. And you, we shouldn't be using science just to, to, to batter down people who have been doing that if it doesn't seem to match what some, some study told us, told us was the typical response to that population subgroup. Uh, and we can't be taking uh, mechanistic studies out of context. So it's just that we just have to know how to use science um, because it can be misused. Okay. So anyway, random rant as I was kind of looking at some posts and and people were uh, basically trashing uh, certain protocols uh, that weren't, you know, confirmed by a scientific study. Um, and what we have to realize is that science typically comes from a question, and questions evolve after the fact. You know, like, why is this happening? But it's already happening, you know? Like, the, the study of protein intake is in response to people taking a higher protein intake than is typically recommended and seeing a better response, you know? Um, the study of different training programs comes from people seeming to get success um, or, you know, in sports science constantly seeing what top level athletes do and then testing it again to see if it, so, so often it's confirming what's already being done. Sometimes it is new, but many times um, science doesn't precede practice, it comes after it, confirms it, and tells us kind of what we might have already known, uh, but not always, the, not always the case. So. I've been rambling a while, a while, that's it, but just some key points to take home about science, okay? Thanks, guys.